Period 3 marks an era of intensification of trade networks and the growth of trading cities. Today we're going to look at some of the most important trading cities that arose during Period 3 across the Silk Roads, Indian Ocean Basin, Trans-Saharan, Mediterranean Basin, and the Americas trade routes. Hangzhou is the southern terminus of the Grand Canal that was built during Period 3 to link the Yellow and Yangtze Rivers. In 1127 CE, the city would be named the capital of the Southern Song Dynasty. Due to its location on the Silk Road, Hangzhou would also host an Arab merchant community that took advantage of the trading goods to be found in the city. As discussed in previous lectures, it was not only trading goods that moved along trade routes, and one item that traveled along the Silk Roads from China was the compass. In the 4th century BCE, the Chinese had known that naturally magnetic lodestones would point north when placed on a board, but eventually the lodestones lost their magnetism, and so were not suited to long sea voyages. Sometime between 850 and 1050, Chinese metallurgists realized that if they heated steel needles to a high temperature and then rapidly cooled them, they could magnetize the needles. Placed on a float of some kind, the buoyant needles pointed north. It was this invention of the steel needle compass and its transmission along the Silk Roads that would allow for deep water navigation and exploration that would truly boom in period four. China would maintain the monopoly on silk at the beginning of period three. By the end of the period, the practice of sericulture had spread far and wide thanks to the conquest of the Islamic empires and the Italian city-states began to produce silk for a European audience. By 1472, there were 84 workshops and 7,000 craftsmen in Florence alone. A new monopoly developed under the Song Dynasty, that of gunpowder. Gunpowder was originally used before 900 primarily for fireworks, but sometime around 900 it was realized that gunpowder could be used as a weapon. However, just like the monopoly on silk, China's monopoly on gunpowder would be gone by the end of period 3. Even while losing out on the monopolies China had previously enjoyed, Hangzhou continued to grow during this time period, ultimately reaching a population of over a million people. 13th century traveler Marco Polo would describe Hangzhou as greater than any in the world, and 14th century traveler Ibn Battuta said it was the greatest city I have ever seen on the face of the earth. The trade route that was most interconnected with the Silk Roads was that of the Indian Ocean Basin. Throughout most of period 3, the Thalosocratic, meaning sea trade-based, city-state of Srivijaya controlled the important trading city of Malacca. Due to its strategic location, Malacca and thus Srivijaya controlled the ever-important spice trade in Southeast Asia. Malacca would be a frequent stopping point for Admiral Zheng He on his expeditions during the early 15th century as part of a government-sponsored exploration during the early Ming Dynasty. The Indian Ocean Basin connected the continents of Asia, Africa, and the Arabian Peninsula, and this travel was made possible because of the invention of the Tao. Unlike most other boats, the Tao's of the Indian Ocean were sewn and not nailed together. Boatmakers sewed planks of teak or coconut trees together with cord and added a single sail. This boat design was so practical that it is still in use today. The rise of the Swahili coast city-states can be largely attributed to the region's extensive participation in the Indian Ocean Basin trade route. One of the important trade cities of the Swahili city-states was Mombasa. A product of the multicultural environment of the Swahili coast was the development of the Swahili language, a fundamentally Bantu language that contains a number of Arabic loanwords. It would also be through cities like Mombasa that Islam would diffuse into sub-Saharan Africa. Mombasa would have a monopoly on two trading goods that spread throughout the Indian Ocean, ivory and slaves. Ivory was and continues to be a luxury item that is mostly used for decorative purposes. It comes from an elephant's tusk and is one of the main reasons elephants are so rare now in nature. And while the slave trade out of Africa had not quite hit the high market would achieve during period 4, there was an active slave trade on both sides of the African coast, as prisoners of war were not ransomed but rather sold into slavery. 
The Indian Ocean Basin and Silk Roads both met up again on the Arabian Peninsula. Baghdad was made the capital of the new Abbasid Caliphate in the 8th century and set on the crossroads of both the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean Basin trade routes. Baghdad would be one of many cities explored by traveler Ibn Battuta as he recorded and observed what he witnessed as he traveled over 75,000 miles during the 14th century. As merchants and travelers continued on their journey along the Silk Roads, they could stay the night in a Carveron Sarai, buildings with a large open courtyard to support large merchant caravans. Carvan Sarai supported the flow of commerce, information, and people along trade routes. In this way, trade along the Silk Road was both protected and strengthened, especially during the Pax Mongolica. As you have by now read, the Abbasid Caliphate was the golden age of Islam, with many inventions. One such invention that made traveling easier was the astrolabe. The astrolabe is a sophisticated mathematical device. After holding the astrolabe up to the sun to determine the angle of the sun's rays, and thus fix the viewer's latitude on Earth, one inserted the appropriate metal plate, which allowed one to chart the movement of the stars and thus calculate your location on Earth. The astrolabe, like the compass, would allow for deep water navigation to develop. Another one of the many places Ibn Battuta traveled was the trading city of Timbuktu, located in the Islamic Mali Empire along the Trans-Saharan Trade Route, or the Gold Salt Trade. The Trans-Saharan trade route was facilitated by the use of the camel as the main animal of burden due to the camel's adaptations to the desert environment. The adoption of the camel for Trans-Saharan trade also allowed Islam to diffuse relatively quickly to West Africa by the 10th century. The Malian Empire's primary source of revenue was taxing trade, which made Mali incredibly wealthy. Mansa Musa I, the word Mansa means king of kings, was so wealthy he could afford to go on the Hajj, and 100 camels were required to carry his travel money, which was some 700 pounds of gold, making Mansa Musa one of the most talked about and most welcome travelers of his day. Mansa Musa was so generous with his wealth on his travels that he actually depressed the economy due to too much money in the money supply. More on this later in the lecture. Just like the Swahili city-states, Timbuktu had a monopoly on ivory and slaves. The slave traders of Mali did not enslave people of their own country. Rather, they captured slaves in the forest belt to the south. When Ibn Battuta left Timbuktu, he was gifted a slave and traveled in a caravan with 600 female slaves. One of the few reliable statistics available Ibn Battuta's observation, combined with a handful of other sources, has led one historian to estimate that 5,500 slaves cross the desert each year between 1,100 and 1,400. Novgorod was the main trading city that linked Russia and Europe. Novgorod was on the northeastern part of the Silk Road, and while not officially a member of the Hanseatic League, it lay on the eastern part of the Baltic trade established by the League. It was through Novgorod and the leadership of Vladimir I that Christianity would enter Russia, and after the schism of 1054, Russia would adopt Orthodox Christianity. Novgorod was known for their monopoly on luxury trade items, of many types of fur, as well as their distinctive glass beads. Constantinople has always since its founding been an important trading city thanks to its location along the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. It set on the end of the Silk Roads into Europe. Venice, however, would rise during period 3 thanks to the new trade routes opened up to Europe through the Crusades. As you hopefully remember from last week, Venice actually helped lead a crusade against Constantinople in 1204, bringing these two trade cities into direct conflict in the 13th century. Merchants from Venice traveled to West Africa and sometimes East Asia, like Marco Polo, to pursue trading opportunities, but you would also have merchants set up shop in Constantinople in order to take advantage of the booming spice trade there. Unfortunately, all this interconnectedness also had a downside. It would be through the trade networks that these two cities so treasured 
that the Black Death would enter into Europe. We'll be looking at the effects of the Black Death on Europe in a later lecture. While Constantinople did not have a distinct monopoly other than its location, Venice would have a monopoly on Murano glass, which is still highly prized to this day. These two cities would only grow in importance throughout period 3 and into period 4. It would be due to the wealth of the city-states of the Italian peninsula that the Renaissance would start in Europe, and it's the conquest of Constantinople that marks the end of period 3. While the Americas were not connected to any other continent during period 3, they still had a booming trade network that connected both North and South America. At its peak in the 13th century, the city of Cahokia had a population of 40,000, which would not be surpassed by any city in the United States until the late 18th century. Cahokia was the main city of the Mississippian Mound culture and would be the center of the booming trade within North America. Two of the most important items traded within Cahokia were buffalo hides and turquoise. Buffalo hides were necessary for clothing and housing in many tribes during this era, but turquoise would be considered a more luxury item. The trading network that started in Cahokia would extend south into Mesoamerica to then connect up with the Andean trade network. The main trading city of the Mesoamerican network was the Aztec capital Tenochtitlan, which at its height had a population of a million people. As discussed in the Aztec lecture, within the Aztec Empire, there were special long-distance traders, the Poteca, who also happened to be spies. The Poteca could travel either north to the North American trade network or south to the Andean trade network. The Mesoamerican trade network connected with another great trading city, Cusco. Centered around the Andean trade network, Cusco was the capital of the Inca Empire high in the Andes, 11,300 feet. One of the trading specialties of the Aztec Empire were macaw feathers. And thanks to the many active volcanoes in South America, the Inca would have a monopoly on obsidian, which was valued for its use as arrowheads. Both Tenochtitlan and Cusco would remain as important trading cities into period 4, although this time under the power of the Spanish Empire, and would finally be connected to the trade networks of Asia, Africa, and Europe. When we look at economic transactions, there are two competing forces we need to understand. The first is supply. Supply is simply the amount of product producers are willing to make available at various price points. As you can see on the graph, as the potential price of a product goes up, the supply available also increases. It's a positive relationship. Big surprise, producers are willing to make more of a product if they know they'll make more money. So if we're talking about, say, Chinese silk, what this means is that the more expensive silk was, the more of it China was willing to produce. The second force is demand. Demand is the price of a product consumers, that's you and me, are willing to pay for a given amount. As you can see on the graph, as the potential price of a product falls, the more of it consumers, or demanders, are willing to buy. It's a negative relationship. So to go back to our Chinese silk example, if silk is very expensive, then people are unwilling to buy it. Now in order to understand the relationship between supply and demand, which is simply the relationship between producers and consumers, we get to equilibrium. On a normal supply and demand graph, the point at which the two curves intersect is called equilibrium. It denotes the perfect price at which consumers are willing to purchase the amount of a product that producers are willing to make. So at the beginning of period 3, Chinese silk hit a sweet spot with consumers in Eurasia. China kept producing silk because they had a market for it. What happens now when this perfect economy takes a hit? When the supply of a product takes a hit, when that product becomes more scarce, we denote that visually by moving the supply curve to the left. As you can see, when a product becomes more scarce, it gets more expensive. The price goes up. When prices increase in a sustained way, it's called inflation. 
For example, when the caliphates were forming in the Middle East, there was an interruption in the supply of silk to Europe, which made silk more expensive there. Conversely, when trade slows down for whatever reason, say when there's political instability, like there was when the Vikings began raiding in Western Europe, and demand falls, we denote that by moving the demand curve to the left. As you can see, when that happens, the price falls. When prices fall in a sustained way, it's called a recession. When a recession lasts for a long time, or when there's a particularly disastrous fall in prices, it's called a depression. So when the Vikings began raiding in Western Europe, they disrupted trade enough that consumers were wary of spending their wealth, so demand fell. <laughs>